I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Roland McCready, the Director of Research of the HeartMath Research Center at the HeartMath Institute. As a psychophysiologist, Dr. McCready's research interests include the physiology of emotion, heart-brain communication, and the global interconnectivity between people and the Earth's energetic systems. Dr. McCready has acted as principal investigator in numerous studies examining the effects of emotions on heart-brain interactions and on autonomic, cardiovascular, hormonal, and immune system function, and outcome studies to determine the benefits of positive emotion-focused interventions and heart rhythm coherence feedback in diverse organizational, educational, and various clinical populations. Dr. McCready has been featured in a number of documentary films, such as I Am, The Truth, The Joy of Socks Move, The Power of the Heart, Solar Revolution, The Living Matrix, and many others. So, Roland, welcome. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you with me today, uh, sir. Pam, it's great to be here with you. Um, yeah. Well, so today we're, discuss we're discussing the Global Consciousness Project 2.0 as part of the larger global coherence initiative that your team at the HeartMath Institute is undertaking. So I want to start out by asking a bit about HeartMath itself. I thought that's the best place to start. So what, it, what are the organizational goals and how did you personally get involved with this? Well, <laughs> that's two questions. Um, the really the the I would say the goal of the heart math organizations. There's really two. There's a nonprofit research which I'm with, and then a, a for profit for profit branch is really to help um, really shift the consciousness of the planet. You know, it's uh, one of our taglines is uh, awakening the heart of humanity. So it's really about. Um, tools techniques technologies training programs that really help people um, get the, their heart and brain aligned uh, literally in sync and i mean that literally physiologically speaking and that really allows us to maintain our composure in the middle of chaos uh it to for the brain to work better to make better decisions in the moment uh, to get along better with each other that's really the ultimate goal i guess you could say social coherence and um I got involved really through personal experience. Um, I won't go into my whole story, but I'm a bit of a serial entrepreneur and pretty successful in, in my my background. And had it was well, I'll give you just a Cliff Notes version. I was um, uh, originally a communication engineer. I used to work for Motorola for a long period, and kind of I don't know had more of a inner desire to understand more. You know, I used to ask professors, you know, in university and things, well, what is a magnetic field or electric field? And uh, I was never satisfied because it was always, well, here's the formula that describes their behavior. No, no, no. What, what is it? Well, don't, mm. ask, don't ask that. Yeah. Go, you'll go away. Right. <laughs> um, literally. So that kind of led me into uh, exploring consciousness. I won't go into that whole story, but which brought, pulled me to California, drew me from there, um, and I uh, got a degree in consciousness studies, uh, one of the first degree granting uh, groups that was was doing that and happened to be here in California. And that through that got involved in Spirulina. It was part of the organization that, I don't know if you've ever heard of Spirulina or not, but- uh, Yeah, brought, yeah. Brought it to the world. I was, in the, I was the head of one of the companies that did that, um, uh, the marketing and sales of it. And we took the profits of that. We, I won't go through the whole story here and built a demonstration plant in uh, Southern California to prove that you could actually grow spirulina and feed the world's hungry populations, right? It was really the humanitarian aspect of it. So it drew me to it. And that went nowhere. <laughs> I mean, we're way ahead of our time. We did it. But, but it, as far as it actually being, you know, um, what its purpose well, was, it was really and, blocked and at political levels and, yeah, spirulina was uh, promoted as you know the ultimate superfood for quite yeah. a while, and and it still is consumed yeah. regularly by many people. So. Yeah, for, for sure. But so that's you know in hindsight, I can I talk about that's when my idealism bubble got popped. Mm, you know, okay. I, I had a degree in consciousness studies, right? I mean, it's all about consciousness. Well, yeah, but that became a very visceral understanding that no it's a problem in consciousness we had the technology right it was um it was really political 
blockages and all the stuff that went on. That's where it, why it didn't go anywhere. And we, we could go riff on that for the whole show, but I, I, won't, I won't go there. because it's not what we're talking about, but so it, yeah, said, it's, it, yeah. well, it, it is, it is intriguing. It's intriguing to, you know, to hear this learning and growth process that you've gone through. I, I think that we've all gone through that. Right. And you have to balance idealism against the practical achievable goals. And that's yeah. always a challenge. Yeah. Well, we, so it's really not about technology. It, it is a problem in consciousness. I'll, yeah. I'll give you another, I'll just give you one other quick example of why that is so, so real. You know, I, I had run across a, a quote somewhere that said that with 10% of the world's military budget, we could feed, house, educate, clean water, every person on earth. And I could never track down, you know, I don't like to reference things that I don't really know the source for. And, and I, I, in fact, I got a book right here. I find a couple of years ago, ran into Celia um, Elworthy, who wrote the book, Business Plan for Peace. Ah, okay. And we were having a meeting here and, and uh, she was visiting. And I, I asked her about that because I figured she knew. And she goes, no, 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 Roland. That's not, that's not right. And I'm, oh, okay. She goes, it's far less than 10% of the world's military budget that's a problem in consciousness yeah yeah right, right. well you know, and i i think awareness and focus right it and and paradigms i think that's yeah yeah anyway you get my point that's we've um we need to grow up learn how to get along basically that's, absolutely that's, that's the next step in consciousness and that's really what heart math is about yeah. Well, so, so far we've, we've talked about, I mean, we're using terms like, uh, peace, harmony, consciousness, things like that. So at least part of my audience is probably terrified because we're using new age terms. One of the things that I want to drill down on is that the, the work that you're doing and the global coherence initiative and the global consciousness project as a result of that is data driven science yeah. and that that is one of the things that makes it so exciting is you know you are where the rubber meets the road figuratively speaking this is a science based international effort that conducts research on interactions between humans and the earth's magnetic field environment as well as collective intention uh, now, so the primary focus of GCI, as you've written, is research that examines the dynamic relationship between human consciousness, as well as physiology, emotions, behaviors, and more, and the Earth's energetic environment, which is basically the electromagnetic envelope that we live in on Earth. So how would you describe that environment, and, and how how does that interact in kind of a big way? Yeah, great question. The let me tell it the story this way. So we, every living system, even if you're in this space station, you are within the magnetic field of the Earth. Now, this is something we learned about back in science class and probably these days in middle school, right? Uh, we have the geomagnetic field, right? North Pole, South Pole, thing compasses tune into. That's that's a magnetic field. Now. It, I'm going to invite our listeners to travel time travel back to when we were in school and doing in science class. I think most people got to do the experiments where you dump iron filings on a glass plate, right? And you stick a magnet under it and it, the filings magically kind of dance around and show you the shape of your, the field, you know, whether it's a horseshoe magnet or a bar or whatever, right? But recall that those iron filings line up in parallel lines next to each other. So that really simple little experiment lets us also visualize what are called magnetic field lines. Okay. Now, I didn't even know what I'm about to tell you as a communication engineer. I knew a lot about how to use magnetic field, electromagnetic fields to carry information around the world. I did it professionally for years, right? Or I transitioned into psychophysiology. Uh, that's another story. But the what I what is really fascinating is that Magnetic field lines act like guitar strings or any stringed instrument. You can pluck them and they vibrate. Mm, okay. Okay. And those are technical term for that. It's called field line resonances. Okay. Finally, a science term that makes sense and kind of says what it is. So the, the magnetic field lines of earth are really long. And so just like in a guitar or, you know, you know you, the length of the string and how tight or tense it is, the tension on it determines its resonant frequency, the node it vibrates at. 
Okay, so here we have Earth, you know, floating around here in space, and meanwhile it's turning, and you have the solar wind, which is travels about a million miles per hour on a quiet day, pushing in the field on the daytime side and stretching out at the field on the nighttime side. That's all stuff we learned in science class, hopefully. Yeah, but meanwhile Earth is turning in that in that, and that's what's plucking the strings of Earth, the magnetic field strings. So they're vibrating. As it turns out, the frequency that they vibrate at in, in our normal times is this, exactly the same frequency as our heart rhythms, as a human heart rhythm. When, especially when we're in what we call a heart rhythm coherent state, which we naturally go into, Tim, when we feel good. You know, when we're, you know, you walk out the door in the morning, and you go, oh God, what a beautiful day. You have that feeling. And we may not call that appreciation, but that's what we're feeling. Yeah. You know, the yeah. blue skies, the right temperature, and you just, oh, God, what a gorgeous day. That feeling we have naturally takes us into, into a, a heart coherent state. Okay. Now, there's another set of uh, magnetic waves that are relevant to this discussion that are a completely different mechanism, not to be confused with the vibrating field lines of the Earth's field. And those are called Schumann resonances. And Schumann was a German mathematician who predicted the existence of these things. So they got named after him when they were discovered, actually uh, proven. And these are magnetic waves bouncing around the surface of the earth, between the surface and the uh, what's called the ionosphere. And if you're not familiar with that, think of it as a soap bubble around the planet of a highly ionized uh, called plasma. Um, and the one of the properties of the plasma of the, of the ionosphere is that it's like a mirror to magnetic waves. They bounce off of it. Hmm. So okay. That's how ham radio operators work, right? If you're here in the U S and you send your radio wave up and it hits the ionosphere and bounces off. It's how you're talking to people in China or Europe and you get a second bounce and then you're talking to people. And yeah. Australia. Yeah. It, well, and a lot of people may not necessarily be familiar with that, but especially it, it if I remember it varies during the day and the night, depending on and solar activity, but <laughs> Yeah, the idea is in, in general radio waves are, are tend to be limited by line of sight as i recall but right. they by bouncing them off the ionosphere ham radio operators are able to communicate all the way around the globe right. and and they're able to do that because of this mirror effect that you're describing exactly, exactly. you know same thing with the higher power am radio stations they call them the clear channel stations they have to turn down the power at night Otherwise, it's bouncing around and causing interference all around the world, right? So, uh, same same principle. Anyway, that's um, the point. Is that the when um, magnetic waves get created in this cavity between the Earth and the ionosphere, if they fit the geometry, right? They amplify each other and become globally propagating standing waves. That just means they're everywhere all the time. Uh, and that's the Schumann resonances. That's the Schumann resonances, and there's eight of them. The first one is 7.83 hertz. The same free, they, and these were first experimentally measured in late 1959 and in, in the early 60s. Immediately recognized, wait a minute, 7.8 hertz, brainwave. That's the same frequency as what's called alpha rhythm in our brainwaves, right between alpha and theta. But all eight, we now know, of these Schumann resonances overlap with our brainwaves. Well, so what? You might ask me. Um, back to science class again. Um, most of us got to play with tuning forks, right? You know, the, the two tuning forks and you tap one. If it's the same frequency, the other starts to kind of magically vibrate, you know, with it, even though you didn't touch it. And even he didn't do the experiment, but about everybody knows of that, that phenomena. And what that's a demonstration of is what's more technically called as resonant coupling. Hmm. Which means that okay. you can transfer energy and information between things that vibrate at the same frequency. Right? Yeah. Well, and and so I think, I mean, one of the things that jumped out at me when I was working on these questions was this idea that all life, human beings especially, but all life evolved here on Earth in this electromagnetic envelope, as it were, with the Schumann resonances, uh, Alvin waves that you'd written about, as well as, you know, the, the geomagnetic field itself, and all these different interactions that come with it. And so this is a part of us from a health and biological perspective, right? 
absolutely. You know, on that, one of my, I, I've been fortunate, Tim, to have some really awesome mentors in my life. I mean, we're world famous pioneering researchers, one of which, in relative to what you just said, was a guy named Franz Hallberg. Now, most people will not know that name, but about everybody's going to know this, that he is literally the man who coined the term circadian rhythm. Mm. Right. We all know. Well, I will say all. Most people have heard of circadian rhythms or day-night rhythms, and that uh, is, yeah, uh, in all biology, we have it. Plants have it. Trees have it. All animals have it. Have these circadian rhythms. It's even in the Earth's fields. These circadian rhythms. And what uh, Dr. Hallberg suggested um, before he was pretty vocal about it, actually, he said, we have the, the rhythms in our body and on our physiology, and plants have the rhythms they have, and we all have the same rhythms, because we evolved in the vibrating frequencies of the Earth's fields. Yeah. That's kind of what you were alluding to, I think. Well, and, and there there are so many things that could potentially come out of that, right? I mean, so one of those would be, if those rhythms, if those waves change, if they're misaligned, then there might be biological stress that results, exactly. right? Exactly. And, and, and hundreds of papers have shown that, hundreds of studies, that uh, we like to live in a coherent field environment. Yeah. Right? One that matches us, when we're in sync, when we're when our rhythms are matched with the rhythms in, in the, the field we live in, um, we do better. Uh, we feel better. We sleep better, et cetera. It's when those external rhythms get disturbed that isn't so good that uh, people. Well, it, it, and you know, I I'm I'm jumping around in my questions a little bit, so you know, pl please bear with me. But one of the things when I was working on these, and I remember this from many years ago, about 20 years ago, Washington State, because I'm in the Seattle area, we had a couple of pretty big earthquakes, and those are very rare. We have a lot of really low grade tectonic activity. But, you know, big ones are are rare for us, whereas in California, they happen fairly often. And one of the things that I recall was in both cases, uh, before they happened, it was one of those things that sticks in your head. I, things seemed very quiet, right? And, and with one of those, I was actually outside and I didn't hear any birds chirping and it just seemed quiet. And... And I thought, well, that's strange. And, you know, and then the earthquake happened. Well, those those have electromagnetic activity and then animals can sense that. And so I, to, for me, this kind of aligns to some degree with what you're saying about, again, this is the environment that we evolved in. And there are things that we've adapted to that we're probably not even aware of. They're just part of us, right? And they're part of all life. Right. Yeah, Exactly. Um, we now know, by the way, that you can measure that there are magnetic changes in the field environment that precede larger earthquakes. Yeah, yeah. So you were you were just you were feeling that you were tuned into it, or just you were observing the effects of that. And you're right; animals are way tuned in um, to these changes. Well, so part of this project is the global coherence monitoring system again you guys are deeply involved with the science and the data which i think is amazing because it's it's one thing to have observations and predictions but it's another thing to go out there and measure data and use that to confirm and reinforce and potentially disprove you know other other hypotheses so the Global Coherence Monitoring System is comprised of a network of six magnetometers that are designed to measure geomagnetic and resonant frequencies in the Earth's magnetic field. This includes the Schumann resonances, the Alvin waves, and the other field line resonances. And as, as I understand things from what I've read, you've got these things tuned in so that you've got time and GPS coordinates locked into them, right? So really precision measurements. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, yeah, these are um, well, yeah, there's they are these are state of the art magnetometers specifically designed to measure the the moving fields, the vibrating fields, and that's different. I wish we didn't have to do this ourselves. This is really expensive and uh, not an easy thing to to find these sites around the world. Um, but yeah, we have sites like you said in Saudi Arabia is one, uh, Lithuania, South Africa, New Zealand, and Northern Canada, and here in California, and, and uh, some more. We would have had a couple more out if it hadn't been for the COVID and all that stuff, but. So these are time synchronized, calibrated systems. So it's it's really the only global 
monitoring system looking at all these vibrating fields we live in that exist uh, uh, that certainly that we know of. So we have we know really what the field environment of the Earth is at, at full all the time. This is twenty four seven year year after year monitoring the fields of the Earth, and the reason we're doing that is certainly we've been talking about how the fields affect us, and there's absolutely no question that we're affected. People have different sensitivities to it, but but all life on Earth is affected by the field environments. You know, you may wake up in the morning just feeling out of sorts. You know, um, yeah. no reason. You know, it's not like you had an argument or something or ate some weird food or something. You just wake up feeling edgy, out of sorts. A lot of times if you go check space weather, you know, you find that we had a magnetic storm, as it's called. The, the field is incoherent. Uh, so that's one of the ways we feel that. Or we just don't sleep as well or we're a little edgier. These kinds of things are, are typical symptoms of that. But our, our interest goes a lot deeper than that. I mean, um, we, we know we're affected by the field. That's, that's just confirmed in gazillions of studies now. What I'm suggesting is, Tim, that it's a two-way street. Not only are, are, because of the resonance principles, that's the mechanism, that we also interact with and feed information into that field based on especially what we're our emotional state what we're feeling but thoughts and feelings are also being broadcast now that may sound new age and wacko but no uh, we published a lot of papers on this and just to if I just connect the dot here tim so we when we put electrodes across the body across the chest to measure the electrocardiogram the heartbeat well it's called the electrocardiogram for a reason we are measuring electrical current flow or we put them on the head to measure brain waves, like on cephalogram, same, same thing. Those electrodes are measuring literally the flow of electrical current. Now, physics 101, right? Whenever you have a current flow, you create a magnetic field. And magnetic and electric fields are different things, by the way. We call it electromagnetism because one can produce the other, but they're they have very different properties. Now, one of the properties of magnetic fields is they go through things. And if you don't believe me, stop using your cell phone indoors, right? Um, so there's the magnetic component that goes through the walls, the windows, whatever, to carry the information from your phone to the cell tower. And I, I, from my perspective, the more I've learned about this, the more I'm starting to understand that all of our technology is mirroring what nature already invented. Well, and, and actually, um, again, I, I'm jumping around, but I have to ask about that because so much of our technology uses electromagnetism yeah. you know does that disrupt these fields does that disrupt the synchronization with these fields yeah probably not because the, they're such different frequency okay okay but but that's a whole other topic now uh, don't get me all uh, no matter what i say there i'm going to upset somebody uh, <laughs> um the but the, the point I'm making is, is that the fields that we generate by the heart are quite large. They're in millivolts and they produce magnetic fields that we can measure external to the body quite easily. You know, what's it, it, use a device called a magnetometer. The electrodes don't see the magnetic field. They just see the current flow. So you can measure the human heartbeat feet away from the body with a, you know, sensitive magnetometers. So, and then one of the other things we showed in our, in our early research back in the 90s was this is where my communication engineering background came in handy because using almost exactly the same techniques we would use to decode or demodulate the information being carried by a, what's called a carrier wave, right? In a radio of train of any kind, used to, we can apply those same techniques to the field being generated by the heart. And lo and behold, we are, we are now able to tell what somebody's feeling, their emotional state, with about 75% accuracy, just by sticking a probe out here in space and measuring the information being carried by the field. Yeah. Well, and it, one of the things that comes to my mind is, you know, um, people might look at this and say, well, you know, why would you need communication for magnetic fields when you could just talk? And I, I think that the one of the things, again, that, that, I would remind the audience of is this is evolutionary. And so this existed long before communication. And of course, most animals aren't able to talk, right? And so this is something that all life can use. Now, does this go back to plant studies? I remember in the 1970s, there were a lot of studies about electromagnetic fields influencing the growth of plants and they had some pretty profound results even back then so yeah. did this come out of that or is it just i, I wouldn't say this came out of that um 
necessarily. I, I am aware of some of that. Uh, another one of my friends who's now passed was Clay Baxter. I don't know if you know that name or not, but uh, a book was written about his work called The Secret Life of Plants back in the 80s. And um, Again, another topic. But uh, the point I'm making, though, if I can go back to that, is that what we feel inside you know, our emotions, whether we're angry, upset, or whatever. Yeah, and of course we read body language and tones of voice, but there's also an energetic level of that that goes on, that not only are we radiating those fields, our nervous systems are, think of as a big antenna, so we're also detecting those fields. And, and we all know this, you know, um, it's in our language, you know, the tension was so thick in the room, you could have cut it with a knife, and have all these yeah. Um, you know, back in the 60s, they had it right, good vibes and bad vibes. And that seems to be coming back now to, in, in terms of, of language. And it, it's um, so it, it, this is a huge, huge impact on team dynamics, interaction, interactional dynamics in, in, in uh, families and teams. Because there is this unseen communication going on. Now, I want to I don't want to go too wide, but uh, the bigger point in terms of GCI or the Global Coherence Initiative is, is that work also our fields are coupling to the fields of the earth. Right. So that we're it's not just us in our local environment, but a, as humanity, as a species, we're all feeding information into the into that field. And so if a lot of people feel something at the same time, like a big, a big news event happens and a lot of people are, are shocked or angry, you know, that a lot of people feeling that, that puts a pulse into the field that can be measured in other ways. In fact, I think you're going to be interviewing one of my colleagues, Nakam, about, Apwaka, about one of the other ways that can be measured. Yeah, yeah, and that that goes back to the Global Consciousness Project. Yeah, right. yeah. so again, kind of a two-way communication. Right. Well, the scientific paper that you gave me for this was entitled Consciousness, the Human Heart, and the Global Energetic Field Environment. And I'm going to put a link into that as well as the HeartMath Institute in the show notes. And so one of the things that I found when I went through this was the amount of data and studies and evidence that you've cited is just overwhelming. I, when I was reading through it, I was like, I don't even know how to cite this because there's so much here. But for instance, um, so one of the things that you talked about, and I, I don't have his name written down in my notes, was a Russian scientist who did research indicating that crime rates and violence went up during periods of heightened solar activity. Yeah, Alexander Chesovsky, and um, he's kind of the father of the field of now called heal biology, the sun effects on on our biology. And what what he showed was was um, really really amazing. Five was first turned on to this his work by Dr. Halberg, actually, who I mentioned earlier. It was kind of mentoring. Said, "Roland, if you're going to be in this business, you got to you got to know the history." You know, I, uh, uh, so he took me back to him. And Chesovsky was a ast Russian astrophysicist, and this were, were during the time of World War One. So he got drafted into the war and sent off to the fronts. To, and uh, so, being a astrophysicist, he was you know keeping one eye on the so solar activity in the sun and all this stuff. And but it, it appeared to him that during higher solar activity periods, that people down here on Earth just kind of got more stupid. <laughs> to, to put it bluntly, um, a lot of your battles, you know, making poor decisions, this kind of thing. So that got him intrigued. So after the war, he did, uh, I would say, was especially God, if you think back then, and you know, in the, uh, at that time period, we didn't have internets and these things, but an exhaustive study of, of world history, human history. And uh, this is what a picture is worth a thousand words here. So he plotted the number of major events that occurred each year. From 1749, that's how long, because, it, because that's how long records existed at that time back for solar activity, to, and then up to 1926 when he first published his work. So there's just kind of graph, you know, going year by year of all the number of major human events, like starts of a war, revolutions, you know, major global impact kind of events. And, and you look at the solar cycle for that same time period, which is a 10 and a half to 11 year cycle. It it's draw dropping. I mean, they're, they're almost exact overlays. Mm, okay. Um, so this indicated that you know human behavior on, on mass scale was being modulated by some type of energy from the sun. 
Now, remember, this is the 20s. We, did, we hadn't discovered hormones yet uh, in, in physiology. X-rays were unknown, ultraviolet, um, you know, higher frequency magnetic fields. None of that was known in his time. And in fact, he predicted, he actually, in his writings, he said there, there's some unknown influence from the sun that has a major impact on human phys biology and physiology. Now, I, I, I have to ask about moon madness, right? Because one of those well-documented things is that when the full moon is out, emergency rooms have higher you know, intake rates. I mean, that's, that's pretty well established. Well, Do you think that's, is that related to this or, or is well, that just. It, it, actually, I think it is that actually there's, that's questionable data. There's a lot of people looked at that and said, no, not really, but. Mm, okay. But, but uh, we work with a lot of hospitals, a lot of hospitals bring heart math in for their staff and trainings and, and resilience trainings and, and all this. And what, what I hear from, hospital administrators all over the place is they do increase staff a lot of times during full moon periods. And it's not necessarily that there's more admissions, but there's a lot more emotional drama. Okay. Okay. During those periods. That's what they tell me they observe. Um, and we've had done other experiments. So there's definitely a full moon effect on physiology. I'm, I'm very convinced of that, but the moon goes through the, there, there is a magnetic interaction between where the moon is relative to the sun and the earth. So I think it is ultimately a magnetically induced uh, effect in, in terms of human humanity. Um, anyway, that answer. Well, you. and so you mentioned hospitals. One of the things that I saw in the paper was um, in, in terms of working with heart math, working with your products and various studies and things, uh, you've engaged over a quarter of a million people in 154 different countries. So I, I wanted to ask, how how are they typically engaged? I understand you do biofeedback, and you're also doing studies, and you're doing scientific measurements with the magnetometers and Global Consciousness Project. Yeah, that, that number is not heart math. That's the Global Coherence Initiative. Okay. Okay, a heart math way bigger reach than, than that uh, over the years. So the, but the, what that number is referring to out of that, that paper is the people who are actively involved in the global coherence initiative. So these are people who are, um, who get it. You know, a lot of them are using one of our apps called the global coherence app to shift to, and synchronize. A lot of it is synchronized events where people come together to shift into a heart coherent state and actually radiate, intentionally radiate more love, more compassion, these types of things into the planetary field environment. Right, because our I'll call it our hypothesis. I think there's more and more evidence is saying this is not crazy. That as we really put a higher vibration, I'm going to call it. Uh, now that may sound new agey, but I'm I I think in frequencies and measure them, so I can say that legally um, into the the field environment. But that has measurable impact on others, and it can help lift us, you know, out of our um, say lower states you know uh, and help so like right now for example we've got groups all around the world radiating more compassion energy towards you know the people suffering from the wars um now that may sound new agey but well but what if that really does help reduce some of the suffering some of the pain some of the emotional stuff going on to give them a bit of a lift that can help offset some of that um, yeah right. well in terms of data collection, uh, another thing that kind of came to mind, this this goes back to the Global Consciousness Project. Um, you know, again, you have uh, basically quantum zener diodes driving these random number generators. Now, in the original project, they were just basically collecting arrays of the random numbers and doing statistics based on that. That required a lot of data. You have taken that to the next level and beyond. Not only do you have a like a multiple array of diodes for each one of these devices, but you're collecting the raw output from these. Nice. And that again, that's just one. Now the, the magnetometers, as another example, I'd read that those are actually measuring magnetic field deviations 130 times a second and cross-correlating that with with time and GPS positioning data. So how do you manage to process all of this data? This must be just like a fire hose of data. It is. And then we've also got, just to add to that, 
uh, a global project measuring the electrical activity of trees all around the world. We're constantly sending data back. So we, what we're really putting together, uh, Tim, is um, multiple tools, if you will, scientific instruments. So I really look at trees as a scientific instrument around the world with electrodes in them monitoring because they're all also in the field environment we're talking about, right? And we got the magnetometers and we've got people using the, the apps to measure their, their heart rhythms. Um, so it's really how do we, all of this data, look at it as a wholeness to, to see what the interrelationships are. And uh, it's challenging to keep up with it all, to, be, to really be honest, because we're, we're a relatively small research group. Um, but, um, you know, we're starting to work with, fortunately, we're drawing some really neat younger people to our work that are really smart. I mean, we're talking uh, people, you know, with physics degrees from Stanford and major universities. We share our data with MIT, for example, from our magnetometers. And um, we have a, a lot of collaborations with actually the University of Lithuania, of all parts. They kind of host our magnetometer site there at the, the, at the university. And, uh, some really smart people that we work with that kind of help manage all that and, and look at different aspects of the data in different ways. Yeah, so lots and lots of data, lots and lots of information. And it, 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 to me, this it seems like it is so useful in terms of you know flushing out the details of you know I mean again all of us evolved inside of this right and it has these subtle influences. And one of the things that I thought about was uh, Elon Musk and others have talked about colonizing other planets, right? Mars at first, and I'm sure others after that. And then that brings up this question of what happens when we leave that field environment? Not just us, but the plants that we grow for food, the animals that we take with us. A, a great question. And what, in fact, one of our collaborators that we've actually published a couple of papers with uh, is a, a pretty high level scientist at NASA. And um, NASA Ames, just not too far from us here where, where we're located. And he's another really smart guy, uh, molecular biologist. And uh, I, I'm going to say he believes, but he believes this because of his data. I mean, he's a yeah. pretty hardcore researcher. That healthy biological function right down to the cell level requires existing in the fields of the earth, the, these external field environments. And he's actually proven this in, in, in different ways. So he, he's doing this work because he's, he's saying for like uh, even going to, uh, to Mars, once you get outside of the field environment, because right now the space station is within the field environment, right? Um, that it is going to require recreating the fields we, that we, we live in for, for healthy space travel. So. Yeah. So there, there is so much to it. Well, Roland, let me thank you so much for your time today. I, I think that we've we've exposed people. This is just the, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. I'm going to put links to the paper in the show notes, and I will let them delve through it and just see the amount of data and studies and and details that you have put in there. And that that will at least get them started. And then I would love to bring you back in the future once people have had a little bit more exposure to this and they're able to kind of wrap their heads around it in a little bit more detail because there is so much and it is so deep and absolutely wonderful material. I want to close by asking uh, what is coming next for you in the next few months because you have so many studies and so much research going on right now. What's coming up in the near future for yourself and HeartMath? Well, uh, a couple things. The um, of course the the which I, you're going to be. I know talking with Nakam, the Global Consciousness Project 2.0. That's really focused on getting that rolled out. That's getting a thousand of these devices around all around the world, uh, feeding information back in to give us another tool for measuring the the effects and what I think of as the global con the field of global consciousness. The other. Uh, thing uh, it's even more important than all the sciencey stuff we're talking about. The measuring is really um, working with people to for and helping giving people the tools, the techniques, the understanding of, of what the heart really is, uh, uh, beyond just pumping blood. Of how the heart and brain work together, and the the heart is that access point to our our higher intelligence. Actually, so we, it's really the programs that bring that into the street, if you will, uh, into um, schools. Um, 
uh, on the nonprofit side, the HeartMath Institute, we work more with law enforcement. Uh, we do a lot of work in, in uh, first responder communities. So we're, um, in fact, we just kind of created a, a new version of one of our programs called Coherence Advantage. It's a training program really for um, organizations, companies. And then another one that uh, we're really um, starting to work with now called Activating the Heart of Teams. So how do leadership teams, sports teams, how do they really become not just personally coherent, and coherent means energy efficient, right? Optimal performance, not just individually, but as a group, as a team. So that uh, as much of our energy is, is really on in that space and, and uh, than it is in the, this global monitoring stuff. But it's all one. It's all important, right? Because how do we how do we feed the field more compassion, more love, more kindness? Right? Absolutely, Roland. Let me thank you again so much for your time today, sir. My pleasure, Kim.